Are we ready? Okay, wonderful. Um, people are joining by the dozens. So I am thrilled to welcome everyone here to this conversation between Debbie Bookchin, Bill McKibben, and Shane Burley. Um, before we get started and I do introductions, so everyone knows this is being recorded. Your videos will not be on, but if you choose to change your name or use a nickname, this would be a good time. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to thank first AK Press, the different co-sponsors, CUNY, the center that's the City University of New York, Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, the Institute for Social Ecology, SUNY Binghamton Sociology Department, and the Emergency Committee for Java for co-sponsoring the event. I'm Marina Citrin. I teach at Binghamton University. I'm, uh, I've been a movement participant since my adolescence. I'm a mother. I write. Um, and I'm right now located in occupied, unseated Havasasne land in um, Western New York. Um, and one thing I wanted to share before we get started, um, I've written a number of books about horizontalism and everyday revolutions and kind of topics that I think we'll touch on in different ways, everyone today. Um, but I'm also part of a group called the Global Tapestry of Alternatives, which is kind of horizontal base networks and communities all over the world. And we had our core group check-in just yesterday. And increasingly, when we do our check-ins, the first people people talk, the first thing people talk about is the weather, where they are. So here we're suffering from so much smoke from the Canadian wildfires. People in India were talking about the heat wave and the death tolls. And it it's 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 the moment we're living and it's intense when your check-in starts with the climate crisis in your location specifically. Um, so I really look forward to this discussion in, in different alternatives. Um, each of the speakers will speak about eight minutes and um, then we're gonna have a discussion and please post your questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. Others will help in monitoring the chat and we'll kind of collect questions and bring them together. Um, as we go into the discussion. Uh, we're going to go till about 6.15, so people have a sense of end time, which is always nice. Great. Okay, so our first speaker, we're going to go in the order of Debbie Bookchin, um, Shane Burley, and then Bill McKibben. Oh, thank you for posting that too. Following the chat and talking is not my skill set, so all the support people want to give me sending more things, that's great. First, I'm thrilled um, that we have Debbie Bookchin speaking. Debbie is a journalist, author, activist, and daughter of the social theorist Murray Bookchin. She has written for The Nation, The New York Review of Books, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many other publications, and served from 1991 through 1994 as press secretary for Bernie Sanders when he was elected, first elected to Congress. Her book, The Virus and the Vaccine, published by St. Martin's Press, is considered a classic study of how the Food and Drug Administration privileges big pharma over public safety. She is currently working on the republication and dissemination of many of her father's works, Murray Bookchin, and is the co-founder and member of the steering committee of the Emergency Committee for Ojava, which supports the 5 million Kurds, Arabs, and others building a feminist ecological grassroots democracy in Northern Syria. Her twiddle hander, handle is at Debbie Bookchin. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much, Marina, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, everybody. I wanna thank everybody, our panelists, of course, and everybody out there for being with us today. Um, it's a really important time, as Marina said, to be discussing the ideas in these books. And I also just wanted to make mention of somebody who's not here today, um, Andy Price, who's the author of Recovering Book Chin, which was, in my view, really is the most important book written about my father's ideas and his life uh, and his work. And Andy, unfortunately, passed away at the end of last year from cancer at way too young at the age of 47 years old. And I'm very thrilled that his partner, who is from the United Kingdom and his partner in the UK, Louise is with us today. So special welcome to Louise. And again, thanks everybody for being here. 
So I want to give a little bit of background about Recovering Bookchin uh, to start. Uh, this is a book that was written in 1992, about 10 years after my father first wrote his, what's considered his magnum opus, The Ecology of Freedom. And, uh, you know, it was written in a way to satisfy uh, a need or a request for many people for a, a sort of a smaller, shorter volume <laughs> that also laid out his ideas the way the ecology of freedom does, um, but that didn't maybe get into quite the same depth of history, anthropology, and, and uh, sort of social theory while still keeping the basic outline of his work. And so that book is really um, remaking society. I think for many people, a really useful introduction to his ideas because it's sort of all there. And as I'm sure many people here know, uh, what he's known for is the originator of this concept of social ecology. And, and the idea of social ecology was sort of originated back really in the, late 1950s and early 60s when he was thinking about all these various environmental problems that were developing, air pollution, water pollution, DDT, pesticides, uh, radioactivity from nuclear power. And, and they're so often, especially back then, viewed in a more siloed fashion. And he wanted to come sort of to terms with what were the social causes of these various problems, which even back in 1964, when he wrote a very important pamphlet called Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, where he even talked about climate change, um, what, what were the roots that would make sense out of these various uh, issues that were becoming increasingly prominent and that today are now truly inescapable? And, and I think one of the ways in which he kind of took social theory beyond um, Marx, you know, in the sort of more economistic way that we think about needing to change society, which is for economic justice, was to, and to add to that and to say what we also really need to address is this whole issue of domination and hierarchy and the evolution of those things uh, that, that have, have made our lives so oppressed in so many ways, but also have really given rise to this whole notion that it's okay to have a rapacious extractive relationship with the natural world. And so in this book and in, 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 in other work of his, he tries to really go to the core of this issue and say, so what is nature? What should our relationship with the natural world be? And he seeks to ask basically, how do we form an ecological ethics and create a more rational society? And one of the ways that um, this whole capitalist mentality of consumption, uh, of grow or die, which is in itself incompatible with stewarding the natural world, one of the ways that that's enforced is through the kind of politics that we currently engage in, this very strong nation state type of representative politics. And so as part of this project, and his project really was not only critical, but also reconstructive at its core, he suggests a way forward, which I think should really resonate now, especially um, because many, many people are asking kind of, where do we go from here? We try to lobby, we try to elect good people to office, but often it feels like change is coming very slowly. And what he says is that the solution is really to bring power back to the local level, to meet together in face-to-face -face popular assemblies, to start on the neighborhood organizational level and to continue to try and build a grassroots directly democratic politics. And to do that in a way where the people that we elect to office beginning at the municipal level are not just free agents, but are really um, 
you know, representatives of delegates is the word that he uses so that they are recallable, they are accountable, and that they're continually engaged on the local level um, and continually speaking with the voice of a community. And that this kind of community politics, it allows us to engage in mutual aid. It allows us to put into practice some of the best attributes of frankly, ecological stability, which is symbiosis, cooperation, care. And so that this is a politics that we can really begin to implement now, I think is one of the main takeaways from this book and from, and it's enlarged in many of his other works as well. Um, and I, I wanted to say that, you know, a lot of people, for example, have been uh, reading and really taken by the very brilliant book, uh, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengrow, and have sort of realized really because of their phenomenal scholarship and their, their you know, archeological and anthropological uh, knowledge that really these highly centralized state oriented societies didn't always exist, even in very complex social relations in very large urban areas, and they don't have to exist. And a lot of people say, well, this is amazing and, and very important, but where do we go from here? So I would suggest that this book and Andy's book, Recovering Bookchin, are really a great place to start as we think about how do we get from here to there. And um, the last thing I'll just say is that, uh, you know, often people think, well, this is so difficult. How do we do this? There are places in which it's being done. Um, I'm sure some people are familiar with the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico. And of course, the expression of those ideas has, has become very uh, full in Rojava, where the Kurdish led uh, area of about 5 million people are putting these ideas of feminism, anti hierarchy, ecological stewardship, and most importantly, direct ground up democracy into practice. So I'll, I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we're going to hear next from Shane Burley and then Bill McKibben. If people can, if you'd like to use the chat to post questions, anything from broad, how do we do it to, do you have a concrete example? Anything. And we'll try and, you know, we're going to do our best to compile them and, and address them and at least begin the discussion. But thinking together in questions is always a wonderful way to move, even if we don't answer all the questions, which we really can't anyway. So, Shane Burley um, is a writer and filmmaker based in Portland, Oregon. He's the author of Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse. That's with AK Press 2021 and Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It, AK Press 2017. And editor of the anthology No Pasaran, Anti-Fascist Dispatches from a World in Crisis, also AK Press 2022. His work is featured in places such as NBC News, The Daily Beast, the Baffler, Al Jazeera, Jacobin, Yes Magazine, Jewish Current, and the Oregon Historical Quarterly. He's the co-author of the forthcoming book, Safety and Solidarity, Fighting Anti-Semitism and Winning a Just World by Melville House, 2024. He can be found on Twitter at, at Shane underscore Burley number one and Instagram at, at Shane Burley. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, big thanks to Debbie for putting this together and Bill for joining us. Um, I feel really touched to be included in this because uh, Murray Booksman's writing has been a part of my life for about 20 years. And I think these books in particular, I feel sort of serendipitous to be involved. Remaking Society is the book I would always give folks if they're interested and kind of curious in Bookchin's work. And Andy Price's book, sort of resonated with my own experience. So I came to Murray Bookchin at a kind of critical juncture in my life. Um, it was just after the 2004 election that continued the Bush presidency. I had been out at Fall Creek in Oregon at the tree sits and blockade organized by Earth First. This was also at the same time when they opened up more county forests in Oregon and in the Cascadia region in general. Despite really, really massive resistance to it, this continued, even accelerated. 
At the time, I was just moving to Eugene, Oregon. This was a time in which what was called the Operation Backfire arrests came. This was uh, what we call the Green Scare, um, different kind of investigations and prosecutions of environmental activists and the Earth Liberation Front. And Eugene was front and center for this, but it was also front and center for a certain kind of critique, one that I felt a little uncomfortable with, but also didn't know how to parse through. These were folks that were talking about, you know, the very idea that humans were the problem here, um, or that people need to retreat from technology entirely, Green Anarchy Magazine and other forces like that. And so I was trying to look for what kind of future could I have as a political person, as a social person in my community? And how would I build up a kind of radical vision that didn't kind of jump into nihilism or retreat from community? And that's when I found a book by Maria Bookchin. It was called Anarchism, Marxism, and the Future of the Left. It's another book published by AK Press that people should definitely check out, particularly when thinking about Bookchin's life. But what it did was offers an entirely new vision, not just for how to chart towards an ecological future outside of the kind of deep green nihilism or outside the liberal reformism that I had just watched fail so spectacularly. But instead it was one that tied with every other social issue I was talking about at the time. All these things were now put together into a really, really infrastructural analysis. But what really struck me about Andy Price's book and one of the things that's so enjoyable about it was that we had a common experience. When I first showed someone, they asked me, what, what book are you reading? And I said, oh, it's a book by Murray Bookchin. Have you heard of him? And I immediately saw a kind of curmudgeonly response to face someone that had been a part of internal leftist squabbles I wasn't really a part of at the time. And so this had been an experience that I'd had over the years. Uh, Murray Bookchin has strong opinions and they're heterodox opinions. They run ag directly against different sort of um, sacred ideas on the left. And so Andy starts the book with an experience like that. And then that's what the project of the book is. It's recovering Bookchin. What does he really say? What did he offer? Do we remember it correctly? And then even more than that, what does this offer for the future? And I think as we've seen, as we'll talk about in Rojava, um, movements like symbiosis in the US and other people charting a different future for the environmental movement, we are recovering Bookchin really profoundly today. And it's giving us the ability not just to think through these social issues, but to go so much deeper than what we've been offered before by the radical left, uh, by the center left and, and kind of any of the other movements. And so I think both of these books together offer not just a great kind of deep analysis, but a good introduction. This is where I personally would want readers to start and to really beginning that journey. So I'll pass it off to, to Bill. I know we'll get to talk about more of this in, in conversation. Fantastic. Um, Bill, I'm going to introduce you, even though I'm sure the 120 people here right now are familiar. Um, and it's important that we do this, actually, both to introduce ourselves, but also celebrating things we've done, more, more celebration as far as incredible work that all of you do. Um, Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to The New Yorker and a founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 to work on climate and racial justice. He founded the first global grassroots campaign, 350.org, and serves as the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. In 2014, he was awarded the Right Livelihood Prize, sometimes called the Alternative Nobel in the Swedish Parliament. He also won the Gandhi Peace Award and numerous honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities. He has written over a dozen books about the environment, including his first, The End of Nature, yep. published in 1989, and his latest book, the Flag, the Cross, and the Station Wagon, a graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Marina, thank you so much. And what a pleasure to get to join this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm linked to it in a couple of uh, small ways. One that I've spent my life to uh, uh, as uh, working in uh, things at least loosely related to the environment. And the second is that, um, uh, like Murray Bookchin, I moved to Vermont at a certain point in my life, and it was an important move. Um, among other things, that sense of localism that Debbie was describing is palpable in Vermont, where we still govern ourselves by town meeting. And I have no doubt that that played a large role in the intellectual 
uh, maturation of uh, Murray Bookchin. And one of the reasons why that new part of his thinking became so prominent and, and important going forward. Um, and I think that actually we're now living in a moment where his insights about things, um, I mean, he was clearly well ahead of his time and happily time is now catching up to him, which is what one hopes always. Um, you know, the environmentalism of the 1960s when he was beginning his career and, and later than that, was deeply tied to the conservation movement in this country. Um, that's in, uh, in many ways an honorable past, though often too with some dishonorable parts of it. Um, but uh, that's largely where it came from. And, and in the 1960s, it began to be intercepted in different ways. Uh, Rachel Carson powerfully began to knock the shine off modernity with Silent Spring. Actually work that echoed some of the early Bookchin work on these uh, same questions. But what really powerfully shines through is this sense that there's no way to disconnect the environmental predicaments from which we find ourselves with all the other predicaments from which we find ourselves, that they are intimately related to economic systems, to historic oppressions, to the way that power is organized, to all those things. Um, really, one of Bookchin's most important heirs, I think, is my old and dear friend, Naomi Klein, whose book, This Changes Everything, uh, took the climate crisis as a way to kind of make that point in the broadest sense. And I'm not at all surprised that Naomi um, or Shane or many other people came to this work in part through their own efforts at organizing, at resistance, at figuring out ways forward, because that's really, I mean, uh, unless you're engaged in those things, then I, I have no idea why anyone would want to even be reading this sort of stuff it's only it only matters in the context of the battles that we have to fight and that we are fighting i've spent my life in those and um and have you know in many ways slowly turned in that direction of understanding uh the deeper richer uh, uh um, implications of all this work on the other hand I also have understand more every day the emergency nature of the work that we're engaged in too. Um, you know, we're on the edge of uh, the, the the next uh, step phase change in the planet's climate. We're about to enter a serious El Nino period. It's going to give us a new record global temperature sometime this year or next we're probably going to at least temporarily go past the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark that we identified in Paris as the thing to avoid. And it's gonna create chaos and havoc on a scale that literally no humans ever seen before because no humans ever been alive on a planet as hot as this one. So emergencies call for um, urgent action. And some of that action is, I think, uh, has no choice but to be about uh, the technological substitution of solar power and wind power and batteries for burning coal and gas and oil. If we don't do it, our, you know, we're going to heat the planet three degrees Celsius, and that's going to cut off civilization as we've known it at the knees. There's just too much violent chaos and flux in those numbers to survive. So what's interesting for me and what I've been thinking about and trying to sort of organize a little bit about in recent years is how we might use that transition to a renewable energy world in this case that we have to make in order to also try and accomplish some of those other goals that we would be very smart to be trying to deal with. Um, I think that there's one of the things I love about renewable energy is that it's at least somewhat more inherently local 
than what it replaces. Coal and gas and oil are only available in a few places around the planet. The people who control those places end up with huge amounts of power, which they then routinely abuse. In our country, it was the Koch brothers who were our biggest oil and gas barons. They own more refining capacity and pipelines than anybody else. They use their winnings to buy one of our political parties and completely degrade and deform our democracy in ways that are continuing to play out in the most horrifying realities. Uh, in you know Europe, the biggest oil and gas winner is Vladimir Putin, who's decided to use his winnings to launch a land war in Europe in the 21st century. Um, something that's so grim that it's hard to even uh, imagine. Although I've been on the phone today with colleagues in Ukraine who are working really, really hard to think about how to rebuild that country in the wake of, uh, 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 well, what one hopes is their eventual ability to reclaim their sovereignty and, and make a country. Um, at any rate, this strikes me as a very doable task if we set our minds to it. We have to rebuild the physical underpinnings of our planet over the next 20 years because physics leaves us no choice. But we can do it in ways that resubstantiate the current prevailing order, or we can do it in ways that will help erode some of that. Um, one of the most interesting parts of the world to look at in this regard are the places where uh, renewable energy has gotten its firmest foothold, uh, Scandinavia, Germany. And in every case, there's been a real attention to trying to figure out things like more community ownership of those assets um, um, and the ability to have some local control of them and to have the revenue streams going to local projects and, and local institutions. Um, that kind of work strikes me as really important going forward. Um, because among other things, it can help us begin to deal with some of these other divisions. Remember, the, the second most important thing about climate change, beyond the fact that it's the biggest thing that humans have ever done and will change the planet you know, in ways unseen since the last asteroid hit 70 million years ago, the second most important thing is it's the most unfair thing that's ever happened on our planet, which is saying a lot on a planet that's seen racism and imperialism and colonialism and all those other things. But the, um, the iron law of global warming is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit by it. And at this point, what that means is that there are huge parts of the world where people are increasingly unable even to grow enough food for their families on the small piece of land that they have some control over. Um, we've managed to uh, you know, colonize the climate, um, 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 the temperature, the rainfall, the most direct and immediate things that human beings experience on this planet. So it's precisely the moment for an understanding of ecology in its deepest, richest, most interesting forms. And that we have to do that in the middle of an emergency and that we don't have the luxury of saying, let's get everything right before we try and put out the fire makes it on the one hand more difficult and on the other hand more interesting and in some ways more possible to imagine really making change as we go forward here. Thank you, Bill, Debbie, Shane. We have a few questions coming in. A lot of people posting from generally, you know, what is the United States, but also some other parts of the world. Um, and so I'm gonna share kind of merging two of the questions um, to have both all of you address, or if there are other things you wanna raise or ask of each other, because we can go, we're gonna to go till about six o'clock or 6.05. So please add in um, your questions. But two questions that have come up and they, they touch actually exactly on what you were closing with, Bill, um, is the first one has to do with electoral politics and the role of electoral politics. There's a, a bit about it, about the Bernie Sanders campaign. Sorry, I'm home with my child and my dog, and <laughs> so we'll hear them both. Um, 
And then the other question is about, you know, what fun things can we do um, so as to meet our neighbors um, and get to know them? So on the one hand, in the construction of direct democracy, how do we get to know our neighbors and move forward? I'm imagining that's going to this prefigurative idea. How are we enacting right now alternatives? And what about electoral politics and institutional power? I hope everyone could hear me. It's also pretty stuffy. We have the wildfire smoke here, so it's not actually sunset. It's just dark. It's, you know, we've been closed in for two weeks. Um, urgency, for sure. So um, whoever wants to start and maybe pass it to the next person. Debbie, do you want to, or Shane? Um, I I'll say a couple of words. I feel like <clears throat> Bill has certainly been really, really active on this with Third Act, which you might want to talk a little bit about. Um, just on a sort of more so general level, one of the things that I would say is that um, in terms of sort of electoral politics, I think there's no question that we all have to use whatever stopgap measures we can. And if that means you know, working to elect good people to the United States Congress, certainly we go out and we do that or cast our votes for people like Sanders or AOC. Um, I think that what is sort of missing in the equation and the thing that my father was really trying to push people on the left to do more was to also, though, create kind of new institutions, you know, uh, more horizontally based to do, to employ a prefigurative politics, which again, I'm sure Shane can talk about, um, and to really try and, what, you know, what people call build a new world in the shell of the old. And I mean, that's tremendously important because if we are going to go, not only for the very important task, of course, of saving the planet, but also build societies that are free, that are free of all the different forms of domination that we see, ableism, patriarchy, uh, you know, the many, many different things, even bureaucracies, all the social strata. We really also have to put some effort into building those kinds of organizational um, movements and structures uh, on the local municipal level. And, and one of the ways to do that, and as Shane mentioned, there are people even right here in the United States working on that. For example, the umbrella group Symbiosis, which has gathered together a lot of municipal movement type folks and people in all different kinds of movements who are trying to work on the neighborhood level. And that can include just going to a local, many neighborhoods have little local sort of assembly groups that meet together to discuss basic things going on in the neighborhood. It can mean uh, trying to build an actual neighborhood assembly. It's also education is a really important part of this. Education was a huge issue for my father. And it's also one of the things that has really guided the Kurdish movement in Rojava, which is to be engaged in finding people who with whom you have affinity and reading together and studying and sort of preparing for this next step in, in our uh, efforts. So um, I think in terms of electoral politics versus local politics, it's really important to find a balance between them. And um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let others take it from there. I could jump in a little bit. You know, I think that the, the question I think of electoral politics often ends up being sort of a, I don't know if it's a distraction for people on the radical left or debating its efficacy in as much as we should talk about what else are we doing after that? Like, what are we doing in between election cycles? What is it we do to, to kind of collaborate with our neighbors? I noticed a fun question, which was how do you um, break the ice with neighbors you want to collaborate with and in a lot of ways that actually is the question my wife who is an organizer too uh used to say that if you can't organize to um help your neighbor move then you have no business organizing period and there's certain and certain kind of base level of being able how do you connect with your neighbors and your community on these different lines this is in a lot of ways where murray offers so much because he acknowledges the different ways that people organize themselves and identify and how those are vector points at which they can collaborate and organize so i think a lot of it is looking at how do you build the really base connections you need to do a transformative 
to operation. And in a lot of ways, those are the ways that you develop power in the ecological context or around the social context or the places that those sort of interact. So like here locally, I'm in Portland, there was an effort by a lot of folks to join neighborhood associations. Now, neighborhood associations are not winning progressive of the year award. Usually they're homeowners associations, you know, they find people for not trimming their lawn, that's kind of thing. But they thought, do these have options for us to organize as assemblies to transform them? And they really went at that as an option to do go after things like environmental policy at the neighborhood level, um, going after tenant policy, supporting houseless encampments, different ways of approaching the community. They wanted to build those assemblies there. And sometimes that means building something new. Sometimes that's looking at retrofitting what's there. But it is about making a foundation in the community where you're bound together, you're looking at what the needs to the community are. And in a lot of ways, you have that sort of uh, that new world in the shell of the old we're talking about, right? You have that little window into that new world, which I think is necessary to have the kind of revolutionary project of really transforming things. So thinking about how to do that from the ground up is important. It's going to be different in different contexts. And it's going to be different depending on like what communities people are in, what resources they have available. Are there existing democratic institutions that can be used for that? And if there's not, how would you build those? Well, yeah, I, these are, I mean, this is, I never completely understand uh, why people feel the need to choose one method and at the expense of all others. I mean, it always seems to me that we should be looking for different ways to leverage change as much as we can and as quickly as we can. In the United States, in the autumn of even numbered years, we get a chance to vote for who we're going to put in office so it's a that's a moment of leverage and we should use it and and we shouldn't i mean the the voting never strikes me as i mean i think people get wrapped around the axle of um the person i'm voting for isn't i don't isn't good on everything or isn't great or isn't what i'd want voting's just a it's not a moral choice it's just a binary choice you got two names on the ballot you pick the one that you're then going to be able to pressure effectively for the next two years or four years or six years as best you can and that's part of politics but it's not politics you know the day after the elections is important in the political calendar is the day before you got to go to work uh, and then you've got to figure out all these other ways that have nothing to do with electoral politics but are about organizing at a community level, at a state level, at a local level. So we're doing this work now at Third Act, which we started about 18 months ago and has been going great guns. We're at a, a, a we're you know about 60, 70,000 volunteers now across the country, people over the age of 60, and it's really, really fun because half of them are people who were deeply engaged in politics in the 1960s and doing amazing work then and many kept it up their whole lives uh, and half of them are people who've never done anything like it before but deeply interested and they formed along the lines that we're talking not only this national organization but state groups and local groups all over the country that are effectively working city and state politics and they've organized by uh what it is they did during the course of their lives, third act lawyers, third act educators, third act healthcare workers, you know, on and on and on. So they can bring those expertise to bear. And, and this goes to Shane's very good question about fun and uh, things. And there, you know, we're smart enough to realize that, um, you know, the environmental movement and social movements in general have done a far better job of, um, appealing to whichever hemisphere of the human brain it is that likes bar graphs and pie charts and not so good at, at appealing to the part that the more visceral human part of who we are. Um, that's where things like music and art become the great way to break the ice with people around you to get we're organizing now, you know, a, 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 I, I should say, in our case, music is particularly important because for our generation, no matter how many times people go around saying, okay, boomer to us, we get to answer back, yeah, yeah, you're right, but we did produce the greatest music that the world's ever seen. And it is great fun to get to bring all those people 
back into the fold. We're organizing a big road show now for the fall with Patty Smith, you know, and that'll bring all kinds of people back in and let them experience these things in the right spirit. And I would add finally that having a sense of humor about what you do is a pretty important part of organizing because God does it tend towards the dreary and the earnest and the serious. We've been organizing against the big banks that uh, go after that fund the fossil fuel industry. We're taking on, you know, Chase City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, which really are the capital in capitalism. I mean, that's the biggest pots of money on planet Earth, and they're a hard target. So one of the ways to go after them is uh, uh, with, you know, we, we organized this series of 100 demonstrations across the country in March, uh, one weekend in, or one weekday in March. One of the great virtues of working with older people is that Tuesday is a perfectly good day for protests and organizing. Uh, and we had big, you know, rallies and things. The one I was at in Washington, we shut down the four banks for the afternoon with a big sit-in, but the sit-in was conducted entirely in rocking chairs rescued from the Salvation Army and the Goodwill and things. Um, because A, we're too old to sprawl across the sidewalk for hours on end, and B, because it was a great symbol in the Times and the Post and the things. The next day had big stories about the rocking chair rebellion that was you know, coming across the country. Our big banner said fossils against fossil fuels, you know. Um, so we're, we're doing our best to, as we've all got to at all times, to figure out what the, all the different cracks and places in the system where one can stick in a wedge and start to wiggle it and see what progress you can make. And you never know which ones are going to pay off. Sometimes they do. You know, we launched this fossil fuel divestment campaign and it took off. And now we're at $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that are, you know, broken from fossil fuel. And it's been a huge help. But there are other things we've done that haven't worked. And you never know. And you just try and experiment and go back. And uh, social movements are... Um, trial and error at all times. We're making it up as we go along. There's no West Point for the study of, you know, nonviolent uh, uh, social movement building. But I think Shane's uh, wife is exactly right. Um, you know, basically an organizer is someone that other people want to be around and like to be with. And, and, and to, if I could just add to what Bill said, you know, on, on the local level, um, like for example, in my little neighborhood organization here in upstate New York, um, people are talking about how to help new uh, immigrants come into our communities. And a lot of these people, as Bill said, are kind of older. They are the homeowners, the people who you typically find. But, but what my father said was that there is something about ecology and the environmental crisis that really unites everybody. It's not just a question of a class issue. It's not just a matter of one particular interest. It is in all of our in interests and really in all our neighbors' interests for this planet to survive. And so very often, and I know, for example, when I lived in Burlington, there were all kinds of environmental, there was a wood chip plant, there were all kinds of things that were being discussed. And these really offer excellent entry ways to talk with neighbors, to start building this kind of movement together on the local level. But I think what my father was trying to add was that it's really important to um, go beyond protests, which are important, beyond voting, which is important, and start to really institutionalize a new form of horizontal politics that allows people to engage in this face-to-face -face way where we kind of become empowered and realize that we can self-govern, that we can select delegates, that we can run people for local city council and slowly sort of get our hands in the localities the way, unfortunately, the Republicans have done much more successfully over the last couple of decades. Excellent. So there, there, oh, Shane, did you want to, I'm going to throw, can I throw in a few more of the questions that are coming? Go, 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 go throw them in and I'll, I'll get I mean, to I want to throw in a few more questions. I also want to remind us, I guess, of, not I guess, I want to remind us of that we work with our neighbors and we organize together, whether they're neighbors or they're people around us. 
And, and it doesn't seem like it's formal politics. So maybe we forget that we do that. My neighbors and I watch each other's children. Or then, you know, when there are crises, the pandemic, like talk intergenerational support all over the globe. This was this moment where, you know, the states failed us again and again and again, which they do. And so people came together to support each other and check in with their neighbors and see how people were doing or talk on the telephone and find ways to connect and in beautiful ways we're talking tens of millions of people like in that horror at the same time and that happens time and again in crisis so hurricanes blackouts think about we go outside and we find each other and so it i don't think it has to be as complicated as how do we organize politically with the people around us as people are around us and we support each other so how do we kind of move that outward and expanding, I guess, would be more of a question. And that relates to a question that came in much earlier. And I should let you know, too, we now have people from the Netherlands and who are from in Rojava right now. And it's, we're getting more and more global as the discussion goes on. Um, and one of the questions was, you know, similar to in these moments of crisis when the state, whether because, you know, bad intentions or just because of failure, because of levels of hierarchy, you know, isn't as present, isn't supportive. And so we do it for ourselves and with each other. And um, the question is that Rojava and Chiapas are great examples, though they have less of a centralized state is the person's argument and the question. So what would that look like in a place with more of a state? Another question that came in, so because we're looking at, you know, like 15 minutes now total, I'm gonna to put a few more in there and kind of see, and at least we can hear people's voices. It was permaculture versus, de um, Someone was talking about permaculture as an approach in neighborhoods, degrowth versus um, green growth, not necessarily versus, but if there are opinions about that. Um, there's a question about um, in an increasing migratory world, how do we enact this kind of feminist praxis of direct democracy with not necessarily being space-based, how, how, what that could look like. Um, and what about people in your neighborhood who you don't feel safe with and what what could that, you know, is a very local kind of strategy. Um, and I'll stop there with some of the questions and I'll gather some more since it's scrolled really far down there. Well, I can jump in. I'll try and address some of the, the there's a lot of really great questions that came through. I, I think one of the, one of the elements that always stands out to me about Murray's writing is that power is not shied away as something that is to be eliminated or to be kind of like uh, have our noses turned up that necessarily. And in reality, I think in most people's communities, they feel a lot of disempowerment. And so the actual exercise of power of some kind of power, whether it's the power of neighbors coming together or whatever it looks like, the proof that that power can change something transforms people. And when they do it in a really direct way, that shows them what kind of society they can live in. It's incredibly powerful when people get together, they fight and they actually win. And that is the kind of change I think that we'd like to see about people doing it in this, this specific way, doing it, relying on each other, doing it as a local level. And for example, building on ecology, that's the kind of commonality that we all share. I think it's important to acknowledge what one person said was like, I don't feel safe with my neighbors. And that's the reality. In a lot of communities, a lot of people, there's a lot of obviously division. There's also really huge white nationalist movements. Part of this is about finding ways of investing in our actual community. And I'm not going to be Pollyanna about that. That's not always easy, you know, particularly I live in Oregon, a deep blue part of Oregon, but I go 50 miles out east and we're talking about an area the left hasn't gone to in 50 years um, and that they've had total, you know, um, a cutting of social services and things like that. And right wing movements are what fill the gap. And so this is about creating long term investment and in building community in places that haven't had that approach to it. You know, neighborhood groups can get together and do reactionary things too. And they can get together and try and kick out homeless communities. They can get together and try and uh, uh, cut down on environmental regulations. And so it's about coming together and saying, like, how do you build enough trust where you can do that into the future? And that happens in a, in a certain amount, person to person. I, there's a lot of questions about um, things like degrowth, um, about permaculture, and I think those are important questions to ask, but I think it's also important to ask what context do those things happen in. You can have a corporate 
permaculture system that's not actually environmentally sustainable uh, and that has you know inequality in the economics of it and all kinds of things you can have a degrowth that has a sort of racist component to it like there's versions of that and so we should always think i think simultaneously about what are these methods that we achieve something like sustainability but how does that relate to the larger ideas and that's where we get back to murray too these things are interrelated an environmental problem is a social problem you cannot decouple those and so we have to be able to talk about things like the environment and why white supremacy and the historic uh, his histories of, of colonialism at the same time, because only by that will we actually get to the fundamental core of this and finally make the kind of changes that are foundational. Yeah, the reason it's hard is that, um, at least in our country, uh, we've spent the last 40 years um, celebrating a kind of hyper individualism um, that that is predicated on the idea that you don't need your neighbors for anything, um, you know, uh, and I mean explicitly that's pretty much what uh, Ronald Reagan said when he took over markets are going to solve all problems government is the problem, not the solution His pal Maggie Thatcher said there is no such thing as society they are only individual men and women. So if you, you know, if, if that's become the dominant political expression it's no wonder that and and here's the thing. We've lived through a period of 75 years unique in human history in the West when it actually was possible to conduct your life without your neighbors. I mean, if you have a credit card, you can get someone to deliver all the things you need to you know, keep your life going to your front door and you never have to meet anybody again for the rest of your life. But that's not gonna be the next 75 years. We're headed into a period of deep, uh, uh, of deep trouble and in times of trouble, one relies, as humans always have, on the people around them and their neighbors. And the key is going to be, and I think Shane was smart to point it out, to try and keep that from becoming toxic too, uh, to try and make it something um, that uh, 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 works out beautifully in the ways that it can. Just to go back for a second to uh, Murray Bookchin and to uh, his life in Vermont, let me just say that it's not, you know, I mean, some of these things are not just like with the Zapatistas or whatever. Uh, in Vermont, every community has a town meeting once a year where everybody in town gets together and makes the decisions about whether it's time for a new roof for the school and, you know, what the budget's going to be and whatever. And one of the things that that does is in, not enforce, but uh, 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 um, help with a sense of solidarity because you get that you have to listen to other people and work with other people and come to some i mean you know if donald trump tried to stand up in the middle of a vermont town meeting and start ranting on and whatever people would listen politely for a minute or two and then say well it's time for someone else to talk now you know uh, uh move on let me let me just finish by saying that you can see the physical result of that i think in the fact that Vermont had by far the lowest death rate from COVID of any place in the Western world, and far, you know, lower than the uh, uh, equally rural states on all sides of it and things, and it's because as and I think this is really goes to how part of how it was that Murray Bookchin came up with these uh, ideas that it. It's a good reminder that that kind of localism and that kind of power dispersal of power has enormous effects on the people who get to exercise it. Um, it it um, builds some of that sense of neighborliness that we desperately need to recapture in a hyper individualistic society. Debbie. Um, wow, you know, I just wanted to say people are raising so many interesting questions. And I think I know I, I, Bill does have important things to do in, in, in the next 10 minutes or so, but I hope we can we'll continue on for maybe another 10 minutes or so after that so that we can really continue to discuss a little bit. Um, what I, what uh, people are raising really important, interesting things here. and. Um, first of all, on the subject of 
um, town meetings, as Bill said, there is a rich American tradition of town meetings. Uh, unfortunately, much of it has dissipated and disappeared, but Vermont still does have very strong town meetings. And there, so it's not something that just happens in Rojava. It's not something that just happens in other parts of the world. Admittedly, it's a lot harder to implement this kind of serious local control when the state is still so powerful. So in a place like Rojava, the state did, the Syrian state did withdraw. Um, and so that gave them an opportunity that we don't obviously automatically have. On the other hand, they had spent very many, many, many years in advance of the 2012 sort of ability to kind of take over that region, which is about the size, the landmass of Massachusetts. They had spent many years on education. And so education really is a very fundamental part of this. I think as, as um, folks have said, you know, you wouldn't want to turn over your locality instantly to a neighborhood because people frankly are right now, many of them in a very reactionary place. And that's why education is so important. And as Marina said, sort of what we do with our neighbors is important because in a certain sense, we are, and Murray writes about this extensively in this book and in others, we are developing the sort of moral and ethical character that we need to be, to develop in order to be the true stewards of our communities and of our natural environment. Um, we have to learn together why it is that things like mutual aid are much more beneficial, that, that everybody rises and, and is a much more beneficial approach to society than, an, than a more sort of individualist one. And another person mentioned the question of eco-fascism. And I think that um, one of the things that Andy's book does so eloquently, and, and again, maybe Shane can speak to this, is he, he really talks about why it's very important for us to think about, as Bookchin does, what it means to create a rational ecological society. And it is true that sometimes these ideas lend themselves to people who become very misanthropic. They say, oh, nature should just take its course. Human beings are all horrible. We should just be wiped off the planet of the earth. We deserve what we get. And, and you know, my father has written extensively about how important it is to make the distinction between the human race and the capitalist corporate monopoly system that we live under. And you know, he, he recounts a story um, about being in the Museum of Natural History, which I remember very well, because he used to take me there when I was a child and seeing a big exhibit on bio, on, on you know, biodestruction basically and problems with pollution. And at the end of the exhibit, it sort of said the greatest danger to the environment is, and there was a mirror there. And we recall, you know, sitting there and watching a, a, a little girl, a black girl standing there and staring at herself. You know, you simply cannot equate all of humanity given the, the huge variety of social stratification with destruction. And so I think this issue of ecofascism is important. And what I would suggest is that the Institute for Social Ecology, which my father co-founded in 1974 in Vermont uh, at Goddard College originally, and then it became independent, um, has done wonderful seminars on this subject. And I would urge everybody, and I hope that they'll put it um, in the chat, how to reach the Institute for Social Ecology. And in fact, they're doing a really great summer program coming up uh, during the first week in July. So that's some another way to really look at, there's been some great articles written about that. Um, and, you know, just again, this whole question of how to dismantle patriarchy these are things that are gonna take time. And another person raised the question about extinction rebellion. These kinds of protests, as Bill said, all of them are important. All the things we do are important, but at the same time, it's really important. We've been doing this now for 50 years. And so it's obviously important that we try something new as well, which is really rebuilding this sense of community empowerment 
taking back our communities, electing people, and then doing like they do in Russia, but confederating so that power rises from the bottom up instead of the top down. Yeah. I, Sorry, but just Shane, I know, I, Bill, you have five minutes or you have like two minutes. Yes, I've got to go. I'm afraid I've promised on the, uh, on the TV someplace, so I've got to go and do that. I just really wanted to say enormous thanks to everybody. What a rich and deep discussion and a reminder of just how rich and deep Murray Clifton's writings are. They're really a resource to be digging into. As I say, now probably more than at the time they were written because uh, they make more sense. They, they, they make even more sense now that we understand just how fundamental the crisis we're facing is. You know, when we were dealing with dirty air and dirty water, there were a series of technical fixes that we could and did employ to, you know, the catalytic converter on your car, whatever. When we're dealing with climate change, which is the biggest thing humans have ever done by several orders of magnitude, there is no fix short of, as Naomi said, changing pretty much everything to try and deal with it. And we're going to have to be doing it all at once. We can't sequence it in some ideal way. So our job is to pick our way through that as best we can. Um, we're, we're, you know, emergency room attendants, not uh, uh, scalpel wielding surgeons at this point. And, and that's, I think, important to bear in mind and just exactly why this understanding of power is so useful as we go about that work. So many, many thanks, Debbie, for including me in this. And, and Marina and Shane and everybody else, such thanks for your insights. I've learned a ton today. And I apologize for having to uh, take off. Don't uh, keep the party going. And uh, oh, thank I'll look you. forward to seeing the recording of it. Take care, y'all. Thank Thanks so much, Bill. And, and Bill is off to talk to the mainstream media and continue to have this conversation everywhere. Um, so Shane, I think, so we have about 13 more minutes um, with our conversation and Shane, and this is being recorded. Some people continue to ask. It's going to be, it's recorded. It'll be available on AK Press's YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. I wanted to pick up on the, the question. A number of people in the chat talked, asked about ecofascism. Um, that's actually one of the places where I think Andy's book shines so well is that it actually starts with that. And it sort of reminds how contemporary and sophisticated Murray's writing on ecofascism actually was, um, and particularly getting to some of the driving issues and some of the rhetoric around it. Particularly, for example, he talks around the kind of myth of population politics that you see in a lot of the, both it was in deep ecology circles and kind of this modern ecofascism. But it, what it really does is give practical tools for assessing that and for charting out another kind of radical path. A lot of what underlies sort of on the one hand, kind of like eco-irrationalism, but on the other hand, open eco-fascism is the demand that what we've done has failed and that we need something else, that we're going to have to sacrifice something really profound about ourselves to solve it. And Murray actually charts out an alternative to that that is just as profound about transforming society. And it does it by actually validating people's experiences and the actual subject of harm they've experienced. And so some of the ideas that he talks about this are stuff that we're just talking about now, except he's writing about this, you know, in remaking society, you know, uh, but 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. So I think like this is the part of like uncovering this is actually undercovering an anti-fascist toolkit because we're actually able to take it on. And it's not about just challenging eco-fascism. It's about literally circumventing the impulse and taking over over the environmental movement with a radical alternative that's built fundamentally on the opposition to white supremacy, colonialism, and the, the fundamental hierarchies that underlie those systems. And, and if I could add, um, you know, one of the really critical aspects of his social theory is that he's really trying to base it on a philosophy really and ethics to develop an ethics about how we can live as a society and interact with nature. And I think one of his really important interventions in terms of that whole conversation is that 
human beings are not apart from nature. We are part of nature. And this whole idea that somehow we're separate and that we all we can do is have a destructive impact on the natural world is simply wrong. And I mean, it's, it's social uh, structures that, that create human beings, capitalism particularly, that do that. But what, one of the things that I think that he says that's so insightful is that we have, as nature, we have the ability to intervene destructively or constructively. We are part of nature. We are nature rendered self-conscious, he says. In other words, we grow out of nature. And, and this is, again, based on a whole sort of cosmology that he develops about how nature is evolving ever more towards a greater and greater level of sort of consciousness with human beings being at the pinnacle of that. And as such, our job is to steward nature. Our job is to intervene in creative ways. Our job is to make sure that we nurture the natural world around us and that we nurture our human communities and that this striving, which is ultimately a striving towards freedom can find its expression in good alternate technologies, just like Bill said, so, so important. Uh, I think somebody mentioned in the chat that Murray had been writing about this back in the, in the late 1960s in an essay called Towards a Liberatory Technology, another great essay that technology isn't per se good or bad. It has to do with how we use it. So through technologies and through building that sense of community um, and solidarity that really reflects, again, the best and most sort of symbiotic relationship, whether it's you know, in the in the biosphere or 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 among within human society, we are nature rendered self conscious, and we can intervene in very constructive ways. And this idea that somehow, uh, you know, human beings, all human beings are bad, just doesn't fly. So that's a very interesting part of both Andy's book and and Murray's social theory. Wonderful. Um, for a last, and this is kind of what I'm gathering from some of the comments, and it's not what's being asked specifically, but I'm wondering in the last few minutes, if both Shane and Debbie, you could address a concrete, whether kind of local or local and global, meaning, you know, not necessarily in your neighborhood, in your immediate geography um, example, but ideally something that just gives you hope in that concrete sense of hope, um, something that's going on that we can kind of hold on to in a substantive way. And it can be global, it could be everything. Um, yeah. Well, I can kick it off. I think the massive growth of mutual aid organizations is really, really special and it is unique to now. Um, in a certain way, the state's failure to provide any actual support for people, particularly during COVID and the crisis afterwards, has made it in such a so apparent that we have to depend on each other, and that's coming out in really, really profound ways. I live in Portland, Oregon. There are dozens, dozens of mutual aid organizations here that provide different things that work out in a geographic or, or a, like kind of a substantive basis. The way they coordinate this is a uh, um, a really profound community, large scale project that is really incredible. I think the growth of the alternative labor movement is actually really exciting. This was something that, you know, I'm an IWW member. This is something that happened to the edges of the labor movement for a few years and years and years, but we're seeing actually really large scale projects. Earlier today, I was just talking with um, some public sector workers that organized independently for an 800 person unit here in Portland, won their election and are now go going forward. There's this happening all across the country. This is a really big change and growth. Uh, I think there's just a massive change in how social movements coordinate and organize. And people are thinking not just about how to have mass mobilizations, but they're thinking about what how this actually functionally works. And they're creating an alignment between means and ends. People are thinking about organizing how it works and how that could lead to a different world. And there we are living through really profound crisis, but people are looking at this not just as crisis, but what do I use, what do I create to fill the gap that's been created by this? And I think people are doing that in ways they wouldn't have been capable of 20 or 30 years ago because of the trajectory people have made. Thanks. Um, I I uh, completely agree with Shane, and I but I would and I would add a couple of other thoughts. One is that 
I think mutual aid is incredibly important because it really is playing a role, not only in helping people who badly need it in our communities, but it is also helping us sort of reshape our consciousness, thinking about just these sort of activities that we can do that again, have a kind of a prefigurative quality to them. The one caveat that I wanna raise about that is that I think it's really important for mutual aid not to end up being, I don't know, sort of a only kind of form of charity. I think it's really important that, <clears throat> that we extend mutual aid in a very self-conscious way into helping people become empowered. And again, as I keep reiterating, building sort of alternative structures because we can otherwise get so involved in mutual aid that we sort of just sustain the society by providing sort of a, 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 a kind of a you know charity that doesn't take on really the basis of the huge um, impact of capital essentially on all of us and that ultimately we have to meet that challenge as well as part of any mutual aid experience. And in terms of sort of inspiring examples, um, in addition to Rojava, uh, there are really wonderful municipal type movements developing all around the world. I mean, um, just, you know, some of, I'm sure some people are familiar with the Fearless Cities movement that sort of began in uh, Barcelona and that has taken even more radical forms in other communities around the world. You know, in, in Bologna, Italy, for example, the, the movement there, Coalizione Civica, has now, uh, you know, got a vice mayor in office. And so there are um, a sort of a myriad, and they, and they range, you know, some of them are much more focused on traditional electoral politics, but overall, I think they really are having an impact in building consciousness. I think things that that we never would have thought about 30 years ago in terms of our organizing, which was much more um, you know, hierarchical, is now we take for granted that all the organizing has to be horizontal, that there has to be power sharing, that there has to be uh, a predominance of, of women's voices and indigenous voices. All of these things are slowly percolating through our movements. And I find that really inspiring and, and something very exciting to build upon as I said, with, with uh, you know, really trying to get into a politics that brings power to the local level. So we obviously have this crisis, the climate crisis is profound um, and we will have to do everything we can in a stopgap way. But at the same time, 50 years of kind of stopgap measures really hasn't worked. And so in order, I think, to build a new uh, more powerful movement, we have to try and engage on the local level and really, um, you know, make sure that that our politics speaks to the moment and speaks to our true desire for freedom. Beautiful. I'm going to post in here. Thank you both. An event that's happening on Thursday. Um, for people who want to learn more, or if you already know a lot about Rojava and what's been taking place, um, it's a presentation about the Kurdish project of democratic confederalism sponsored by um, Rojava Civil Diplomacy Center. Um, with just a minute or so, a few minutes left, um, there's so many questions that are coming in, and this is going to be recorded again to remind everyone. I'm wondering, Debbie and Shane, what you think about ending with a few questions that you want to pose to everyone for us to think about. Debbie, you why, don't, don't you go, why don't you go first on that? It could, also be just, it could also be my way of, you know, it could also be concluding remarks. It's just so sure. nice both in concluding and in opening. Sure. It's, it's wonderful. First of all, thank you. My first, my first reaction is, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I have not been able to follow the chat real closely because I've been doing this on my phone, which makes it a little harder because I need a new laptop. Um, so I really am, I know that AK Press will also save the chat 
if nothing else for me, because I'm very excited to really read the comments that people have. And, and I know in my own work, as I continue to organize and work on the Kurdish issue and on local municipal issues, I'm going to be very interested in everybody's comments and questions, because these are things that we continue to need to, to discuss. The other thing that I, I guess I would love to, of course, emphasize in closing is that, um, you know, for many, many years, we have really struggled to try and build a left. And there are some optimistic things happening with the movement in terms of climate, but I think overall, a lot of us would have to acknowledge that the left in the United States is pretty weak right now. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is because it is much easier often to protest or to, you know, just sort of work sort of in our tiny sort of niche areas, which, as Bill said, are now, as we all know, much more interconnected, whether we're doing solidarity work. Um, you know, on, on race issues, on ethnic issues, on environmental issues. So I think that this sense of intersectionality that is developing is really important. And that really, I guess what I wanna say is I would urge people to investigate this book and Andy's book and the other works that are out there. There's 25 of them by, by Bookchin, because I think that as I said at the beginning, his effort has never been just to critique. There's so much out there about the problems, but he really wants to offer a constructive alternative, something that we can put into practice that can make this kind of fundamental change that we desperately need so that we can live lives that are truly creative and truly uh, safe from harm and also that keep the environment safe for our children and grandchildren. So I think that's really the note that I would end on. And um, I do look forward to, to uh, the comments. And I also hope that people will think about, you know, whether there are some friends, neighborhood associations, whatever that, that you might engage with and start sort of thinking about how to make inroads into our own local city councils um, and into putting some of these ideas into practice that we've discussed today. Thanks, Debbie. You know, I think, you know, one thing I think that a lot of the comments kind of circulate around this. I One thing that's, I think, important is that when we're talking about building the left or the size of the left, the left is a means to the end. What we actually want is not to build the left, but to build our communities. Um, and what does it take? And I think when we look around, these are the people we have. Um, it's not the people we chose, it's the people that we exist with, and we're going to have to figure out what it's going to take, because a revolutionary movement requires all of us by definition. And so I think figuring out those ways of meeting people's actual needs is going to be at the core. If you're actually meeting people's needs, you do have a revolutionary movement, because that's not what the world gives us now. I also wanted to flag a few things that I thought were really interesting from the chat. One is that a lot of people are posting from DSA that are doing a book that have been reading, a book chin and reading groups and things, which is something we talked about, Debbie, um, which I think is exciting something that that people are, are kind of rediscovering these in larger pieces of the left that it, maybe it wasn't at before. And also a lot of folks are sharing stories and comments about Andy. And I want to, again, just highlight how wonderful his book is. It's going to last for a long time. And his work has been so important. And so I really encourage everyone to discover it alongside uh, Remaking Society. Beautiful. Thank you. And I'm going to suggest as people are kind of all the accolades are coming in and thank you and it's wonderful and that is so important that like let's celebrate the littlest and the biggest steps that we take together and make together and when you shut down your computer or your phone or whatever it is like pause just for a minute or two and think about those connections that you have because you have them and it's who is it where is it and what could be done with that and moving kind of outward and over um and Debbie and Shane and Bill, this was just phenomenal. It'll be available um, on AK Press's uh, YouTube channel. Thank you, AK Press, and all the technical support and everything else. Just wonderful. Thank you.